Heartbeat Alaska is brought to you in part by Brown's Electric Lighting Gallery. Thank you, Brown's Electric, for your generous support of Heartbeat Alaska. Heartbeat Alaska is made possible by Kupik Carlisle Transportation, your full-service transportation and logistics company. Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by Frontier Flying Service. Thank you, Frontier, for getting Heartbeat Alaska airborne. One, two, three, four, let's go. It's Heartbeat. It's a fabulous show. Alaska. Hi, Heartbeat Alaska. It's Heartbeat. <laughs> Alaska. Pull up a chair and enjoy the show. You hear it from Sitka to Barrow. Gather around for Genie's show. It's the alley the Indian and the Eskimo. It's the alley the Indian and the Eskimo. Welcome one, welcome all. You're watching a fabulous, fabulous special on Heartbeat Alaska, a historical walk through Sitka by the local residents. To, to live down here and grow up down here, it's a very unique experience because when I was a small child, there used to be a lot of hemlock trees here behind the houses, old hemlock trees. And hemlock trees, the top of the hemlock trees, they're very, uh, they bend. And on real windy, stormy, windy days, us kids used to climb all those trees all the way up to the very top of the trees, and the wind was blowing so hard that the top of the, the hemlock trees would blow so hard, the weight of us on top of the tree would carry us over to the other tree. So we would move from one hemlock tree to another hemlock tree by moving with the wind. And, and we could tell that the top of the tree would almost break, but, but we'd reach over to the other hemlock tree and Move, move from tree to tree now. These two here are some tribal houses. Mm -hmm. This one and the old ones here. Both of these are quite old. From the 1800s, both houses. The Western culture is slowly but surely pushing my people into a very small area now. I was born in the Indian village. I'll probably pass away here. That's my wish to pass away among my own people. This is one of our oldest buildings here, the Sitka AMB, Alaska Native Brotherhood Hall. Way before my time, 1904, these are all awful old and priceless, very priceless. Clinkett people use this for many, many different functions. Uh, the Alaska Native Brotherhood Hall is, uh, has been designated as a historical site. And you have the founding fathers here and a plaque and I'd like to point out that Catlian was the gentleman that gave the place this what we're standing on. He gave this property to the A and B. So Gil Truitt uh, developed this, and I think it's really nice the work that he did on that. And we'll be here some more of Gil Truitt's work, uh, the Colored Sitka Tribe, and these are well-known basketball players throughout the years. And Peter Simpson is at the center of the picture there because Gil, in his re research, said that uh, Peter Simpson gave the money for the first basketball uniforms that the A and B team has. To the right, you have the Alaska Native Brotherhood Hall. On the left is Sheldon Jackson because a lot of the ball players came from Sheldon Jackson school and they represent the Alaska Native Brotherhood and they were really excellent ball players that uh, came from the uh, A&B basketball team and the, that was the goal of everyone was to beat the Sitka A&B team. 
The native people of Southeast Alaska have very, very, very strong feelings about their culture. Their tradition is very powerful. It goes back through ages and times and hundreds of years, and they're carrying forth that culture. If you go down to Southeast Alaska, you'll get to know the people. You'll get to know their ancestors. And if you meet someone, they're always ready to let you know who their family is. And that's wonderful. That is one of their strong points. Another strong point is their art. Some of the most fabulous art in the world. My name is Tommy Joseph. Um, I'm from Ketchikan, Alaska originally. I've been here for about 17 years in Sitka and 12 years here at the Southeast uh, Culture Center here in, in the Sitka National Historical Park. I just recently fin finished my 12th season working for these people where I demonstrate making stuff for tourists. You know, I don't make stuff for them. I mean, I, I demonstrate making things for them. This is a, just a human portrait mask, uh, which I started. I taught a class with the University of Alaska Southeast just a few weeks ago. Um, and this is what I, what I turned out in that class. And, and uh, all my students did a similar mask. And other things such as this, this is a a dying warrior is what this one is called, and, and it's something new. I had never tried one before, which I'm almost done with now. This type was uh, originally used by shaman and their different uh, things that they did, shaman, the medicine man. Um, examples that I, I looked at to get the, for the idea of do, doing this came from shaman grave houses. Um, this is one I carved last, this last summer uh, during the tourist season. It's a most commonly known as the tide, Tideswoman mask. Um, she controls the, the high tide and low tide. Uh, she has abalone eyes, teeth, and a labret, signifying that this is a female. And the round disc around her head there is representing the moon. And then the abalone is the U form up here and over here, that's the high tide and low tide, signifying the, the tides that she controls. Most of my tools are handmade, This, such as my ads here. This is a an elbow ads. My blade is made from a leaf spring off a truck, which I, I grout and shaped and heat treat to hold an edge. Uh, the handles are from different crooks off or branches off of a a tree. This one's an alder tree branch, the trunk of the tree here. And I use recycle old saw blades and things like that to make my straight knives or bent knives, uh, just whatever, whatever I need to do the jobs I'm doing. And speaking of jobs, in 2001, Tommy, assisted by several others, carved Petersburg's first totem poles and in a ceremony, watched as the totem poles were raised. It was all done by hand. We built uh, two giant tripods in front of the poles on either side and then a um, cross beam joining the two tripods and had ropes going up and over the cross beam as a way, a lever to get them going off the ground and manpower. I gave a signal to back up. They, the people on the ropes just held on and walked backwards and they went up. They were up in a matter of seconds. And for those interested in learning how to carve, Tommy has a bit of advice. Find somebody or a place such as this place to, uh, to watch and observe and hang out, watch somebody. I, that's pretty much how I learned by watching other people do their works and, and asking questions. Just wanted to see how they're doing their stuff. And don't don't give up, keep doing it. Keep going back and seeing them do, do their stuff. Sooner or later, they'll put you to work on it. In the next room over, Manda Miller is carrying on the tradition of beading. I am doing beadwork. I am working on a wolf right now. This one is for myself. I'm taking time to do, do some beadwork for myself. 
what I do is I have two different needles here. Um, I have one to hold the beads and one to sew it down with. I'll push two beads down. And we'll come up from underneath. I'll go on one side. And then I'll go down on the other side. And that locks it in place. I think the one person who really inspired me was my great-grandmother um, and my mother's father's mother. She was uh, 94 when she passed away. She was still giving me tips on how to do beadwork. I had several teachers. Um, my first teacher was my grandmother, uh, my mother's mother, Agnes Johnson. She, uh, she had some beads out one day and I wanted to make some earrings. And so she sat me down and showed me how to make earrings. I also um, I went to a program called the Sick and Native Education Program where they taught how to do the beadwork like this. This is a dance tunic. I didn't do the beadwork on here. My uh, great-grandmother did it. It's a killer whale on here. And then there's some flowers. This is another dance tunic I did for my son. It's a fully beaded wolf. Then on the bottom here, there's some sea leaves on here. That took me three months. That's working on it uh, 14 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, pretty much having no time for my family. But I wanted to push to have it done for, um, it was a celebration 2002 over in Juneau. And I wanted to see him dance in it. This is a, a a ceremonial robe. This is also for my oldest son. This has a big wolf on there. On the side here on the panels, you'll see the wolf tracks going along the side. Um, my father's uh, grandfather designed these wolf tracks. How it be worn. Just put it on. It's got a tab here to hold it on. I was told the hat came from the Russian naval officers. Um, men used them, and we just put, we added dangles on there and added the beadwork. And not only do I do regalia, I do I do jewelry, beaded jewelry. The earrings that I have here. There's the eagle, the killer whale, and the frog. I think it's more pride for myself because it, this is really, it's really hard to do. Um, but once you learn how, like I said, it's really relaxing. When the Spaniards came to our coast in 1774, they took aboard some young men of ascended and higher origin for their knowledge of the coast. They went as far as Kodiak Island and these young men closely watching the Spaniards what, uh, forging iron and closely watching how they made charcoal for heat and the billows, but they made a crude one. So when the uh, Spaniards left, they start on our coast, there was timber of ships that got wrecked across the sea with iron spikes and nails in it. So they went after this timber and burned the timber up and got the nails, iron spikes, and made tools out of it. For some time, they made very crude bracelets. But in time, they began to improve. As time went along, the hiders became the masters of this art. And later on, the slingots picked it up from the hiders. And as time went on, a lot of younger men took interest in it until the salmon industry started. And then all the young men went aboard fishing boats, and only the older men knew this art. As time went along, we almost lost the art of working sterling silver into bracelets. I started in 1974 as an apprentice. 
and in 78, I got hired out here as the instructor. Well, when I first started to uh, supplement my income, as I learned more about the art of engraving and the history of our people, I took quite a bit more interest in it. Now I try to keep improving my work so that the young people who come to learn from me will acquire a lot more knowledge. Right now, I'm 86 years old. I feel I still got more good years to, to work at this. <laughs> Throughout our travels in rural Alaska, we often come across individuals who are dedicating their lives to preserving their culture, passing their culture on, living treasures, and quite often their vision begins with the dream. I kept getting this reoccurring dream every single night and making me miserable. I had me a hard time sleeping, and every night I'd go to sleep. I'd be walk up in, into the cemetery here, and I'd look into the forest, and I'd see these people, and they'd be wearing uh, robes and regalia and stuff like that, and, and there were elderly people there, there were young people there, kids, they looked, the people looked happy. And I remember walking up in, from down here, up into the forest, and seeing these people in the forest, and one elder saw me, noticed me standing there at the edge of the forest, and he reached out his arm like this to, towards me, and his arm fell off. And he got very sad, turned around, went back into the forest. Tears coming out of his eyes. And, and then another elderly lady noticed me standing there, and She reached out like this with both hands and her head leaned forward and, and both arms fell off her, her body and her head fell off and it rolled down the hill. And, and, and as the head rolled down the hill, tears were just coming out of her eyes. It was strange. And then I started noticing changes in the people and then kids were starting to look like there were mischievous, getting away with stuff like they were just act, starting to act out. And I noticed these group of kids playing kickball. And one kid looked at me very mischievously, grabbed the ball and kicked it right towards me. And the ball landed right at my feet. And as and soon as I looked down, I don't know if you've ever seen a human skull but when you first see it, it looks like a smiling face, just the features of a skull. And, and I looked down and I saw that smiling face and the face turned into a skull, but just before it turned into a skull, it said, help me. And I'd wake up as soon as I hear that, help me. And boy, I was having a hard time sleeping. And so I, I ended up having problems at my, on my work. And so I just quit my job and I just came home. And as soon as I got off the jet, I came down to my village and I saw all the, uh, there was a construction going on in my village. And there was these, they were building new homes. And they were building these homes right behind our village. And I knew from my childhood that those were graves back there. So I went back there to look, and there was a backhoe up there. And that backhoe was pulling those coffins out of the ground. No, no respect to the coffin at all. They were, they were pulling these, they, were just, they destroyed this whole graveyard, and, and they were hauling the human remains out to the dump. And, and, and wherever else they were taking them. And, and the whole area was just desecrated of an of a, a ancient burial ground, just desecrated. And there were human remains all over the place. 
and I was so hurt by seeing something like that. Never, never in my life have I ever seen anything like that. So I ended up starting to pick up those human remains with some friends of mine, and we placed them in boxes, and we took them down to the church and left them there. I was starting to get accident prone, and and because I was so stressed out of the destruction that one day I, I decided I, I need to do something. So I went down and we did a reinternment ceremony up here and, and about 500 people showed up and, and after we put all those human remains back into the ground, we, everybody left and I was the only one up there. And I, I cleaned up after we were done and I started to leave and there was these kids right at the edge of this cemetery. They were playing kickball. And these kids uh, noticed me walking down uh, towards them. And one kid gave me this really shifty-eyed look, grabbed his ball and kicked it towards me. And it landed right at my feet. And I looked down, and there it was. It was that human skull. Those kids were playing with a human skull and using it as a kickball. So from that moment, I knew from my dream and my vision what I was intended to do with my life. So that moment, I dedicated the rest of my life to make sure that that kind of thing never happens again. Today, 20 years later, Bob Sam still visits the burial site, maintaining the sacred grounds. The end of the summer, we had all the brush cleared out, and every headstone that you see in this place were all knocked over. Every single one of them were, were this place was just desecrated. And I knew from looking at that, that this was not going to be just a one time thing and just for one summer. It was something that I had that I felt needed attention, long-term attention. And here it is 20 years later almost, and I'm still, I'm still up here doing this work. If I had known back then, I don't know if I would have started it. This place goes back to about 1830s, about the time of Russian contact. This was a traditional Tlingit cemetery. And when they converted to the Orthodox Church, they, they began to place them in here in the, with the Orthodox uh, uh, burials. And it's still being used today. There's still elderly people that are being buried here, elderly that have like husbands and family plots here. They're, so they're still being used here. I have always done this to honor my grandmother, who raised me here in Sitka, and, and I, I feel very close to, who told me about these places when I was small. And, and I remember when I was a small child thinking that I wanted to do something to fix up the damage that was done to these kinds of places. And, and it was a promise that I made to my grandmother and to myself when I was very small, and I fulfilled that promise. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for Harpy Alaska Native News and Native Information. Join us again next week as we take you to more remote village sites. God bless every one of you. We'll see you then.
and um, I, I was at a meeting that was going on in Southeast. It's going to run out. So we need advanced studies on alternative power sources. Like gasoline, it's going to become scarce. We need advanced studies on fuel cells that will replace gasoline. I hear sources that automobiles used in a fuel source, they can go hundreds of miles on a gallon, perhaps run all day on a gallon. Also, we need advanced studies on nutritional knowledge. Some village I've been to, their, their nutritionals are very lacking. Listen to elders, uh, youngsters. Say, I want you to take care of my grandfather when I'm gone to this elders and youth conference. Because this is the culture we're living. I recently been into a village where I lived for three years. They said, "Can you fix my my rudder on my boat? I'll give you a case of these two things." Right now, it, the elders said. We've been listening to the various